From around the globe, it's theCUBE, with digital coverage of AWS reInvent 2020, sponsored by Intel, AWS, and our community partners. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE, coming to you from our Palo Alto studios today for our ongoing coverage of AWS reInvent 2020. It's a digital event like everything else in 2020, and we're excited for, uh, for our next segment, so let's jump into it. We're joined in our next segment by uh, Andrew Rofla. He is the principal and zero trust offering lead at Deloitte & Touche LLP. Andrew, great to see you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, and joining him is Ravi uh, Dabal. He is the AWS Cyber Risk Lead for Deloitte & Touche LLP. Ravi, good to see you as well. Hey, hey Jeff, good to see you as well. Absolutely, so let's jump into it. You guys are all about zero trust, and I know a little bit about zero trust. I've been going to RSA for a number of years, and I think one of the people that you like to quote the analyst is Chase Cunningham from Forrester, who's been doing a lot of work uh, around zero trust, but for folks that aren't really familiar with it, um, Andrew, why don't you give us kind of the 101 about zero trust? What is it, what's it all about, and why is it important? Sure thing, so zero trust is um, it's a conceptual framework that helps organizations deal with kind of the ubiquitous nature of modern enterprise environments. Um, and at its core, zero trust commits to a risk-based approach to enforcing the concept of least privilege across five key pillars, those being users, workloads, data, networks and devices. And the reason we're seeing zero trust really come to the forefront is because modern enterprise environments have, have shifted dramatically, right? There's no longer a defined, a clearly defined perimeter where everything on the outside is inherently consider, considered untrusted and everything on the inside could be considered inherently trusted. There's a couple, what I call macro level drivers that are ch you know, changing the need for organizations to think about securing their enterprises in a more modern way. Um, the first macro level driver is really the evolving business model. So as organizations are pushing to the cloud, um, maybe expanding into, ge into um, what they would consider high risk geographies, dealing with M&A transactions and, and further relying on third and fourth parties to maintain some of their critical business operations, um, the, the data and the assets by which the organization um, transact are no longer within the walls of the data center, right? So again, the perimeter is very much dissolved. The second, you know, macro level driver is really the shifting and evolving workforce, um, especially given the pandemic and the need for organizations to support almost an entirely remote workforce nowadays. Um, organizations are starting to think about how they revamp their traditional VPN technologies in order to provide connectivity to their employees and to other third parties that need to get access to uh, the enterprise. So how do we do so in a secure, scalable, and reliable way? And then the last kind of macro level driver is really the complexity of the IT landscape. So, you know, in legacy environments, organizations only had to support managed devices. And today you're seeing the proliferation of unmanaged devices, whether it be, you know, BYOD devices, um, internet of things devices, or other smart connected devices. So organizations are now, you know, have the need to provide connectivity to some of these other types of devices, but how do you do so in a way that, you know, limits the risk of the expanding threat surface that you might be exposing your organization to by supporting some of these connected devices. So those are some three kind of macro level drivers that are really, you know, constituting the need to think about security in a different way. Right. Well, I love, I, I downloaded, you guys have a, a zero trust point of view document that, that I downloaded. And I like the way that you, you put real specificity around those five pillars. Again, users, workloads, data, networks, and devices. And as you said, you have to take this kind of approach that it's, it's kind of on a need to know basis, the less, you know, at, at kind of the minimum they need to know, but then to do that across all of those five pillars. How hard is that to put in place? I mean, there's a, there's a lot of pieces of this puzzle um, and I'm sure, you know, we talk all the time about baking security in throughout the entire stack. How hard is it to go into a large enterprise and get them started or get them down the road on this zero trust journey? Yeah, so you mentioned the five key pillars. And one thing that we do in our framework is we put data at the center of our framework. And we do that on purpose because at the end of the day, you know, data is the center of all things. It's important for an organization to understand, you know, what data it has, what the criticality of that data is, how that data should be classified and the governance around who and what should access it from a you know, users, workloads, uh, networks and devices perspective. Um, 
I think one misconception is that if an organization wants to go down the path of zero trust, there's a misconception that they have to rip out and replace everything that they have today. Um, it's likely that most organizations are already doing some things that fundamentally align to the concept of least privilege as it relates to zero trust. So it's important to kind of step back, you know, set a vision and a strategy as far as what it is you're trying to protect, why you're trying to protect it, and what capabilities you have in place today, and take more of an incremental and iterative approach towards adoption, starting with some of your kind of lower risk use cases or lower risk parts of your environment, and then implementing lessons learned along the way, along the journey, um, before enforcing, you know, more of those robust controls around your critical assets or your crown jewels, if you will. Right, right. So Ravi, I want to follow up with you. Uh, you know, Andrew just talked about a lot of the kind of macro trends that are driving this, and clearly COVID and work from anywhere is a big one. But one of the ones that he didn't mention that's coming right around the pike is 5G and IoT, right? So 5G and, and IoT, we're going to see, you know, the scale and the volume and the mass of machine generated data, uh, which is really what 5G is all about, grow again exponentially. We've seen enough curves up and to the right on the data growth, but we've barely scratched the surface in what's coming on 5G and IoT. How does that work into your plans and how should people be thinking about security around this kind of new paradigm? Yeah, I think th that's a great question, Jeff. And as you said, you know, I IoT continues to accelerate, uh, especially with the recent investments in 5G that's, you know, pushing, pushing more and more industries and companies to adopt I IoT. Uh, Deloitte has been, in, you know, helping our customers leverage a combination of these technologies, cloud, IOT, ML, and AI, to solve their uh, problems in the industries. For, for instance, uh, we've been helping restaurants automate their operations. Uh, we've helped uh, automate some of the food safety audit processes they have, uh, especially given the COVID situation, that's been helping them a lot. Uh, we are currently working with uh, companies to connect smart wearable devices that, that send the patient vital information back to the cloud. And once it's in the cloud, it goes through further processing upstream through applications and data lakes, et cetera. Uh, the way we've been implementing these solutions is largely leveraging a lot of the native services that AWS provides like device manager that helps you onboard hundreds of devices and group them into different categories. Uh, we leveraged uh, device defender. That's a monitoring service for uh, making sure that uh, the devices are adhering to a particular security baseline. Uh, we also uh, have implemented uh, AWS Greengrass on the edge um, so where the device actually resides um, so that it acts as a central gateway and a secure gateway so that all the devices are able to connect to this gateway and then ultimately connect to the cloud. Uh, one common problem we run into is uh, a lot of the legacy IoT devices, they tend to communicate using insecure protocols and in clear text. Um, so we actually had to leverage AWS Lambda function on the edge to convert these um, legacy protocols into a very secure MQTT protocol that ultimately uh, you know, sends data encrypted to the cloud. Um, so the key thing to recognize and, and the transformational shift here is um, cloud has the uh, ability today to impact security of the device and the edge from the cloud using cloud native services. And that continues to grow. And that's one of the key reasons we're seeing uh, accelerated growth of, and adoption of IoT devices. Uh, and you brought up a point about 5G and, and that's really interesting. And, and uh, a recent set of investments that AWS, for example, has been making, and they launched their AWS Wavelet zones that allow you to deploy uh, compute and storage infrastructure at the 5G edge. So millions of devices, they can connect securely to the compute infrastructure without ever having to leave the 5G network or go over the internet insecurely uh, talking to the cloud infrastructure. Uh, that allows us to actually enable our customers to process uh, large volumes of data uh, in a short near real time. And also uh, it increases the security of the uh, architecture. Um, and, and I think uh, truly uh, this, this 5G combination with IoT and, and cloud AI ML the, the, are the technologies of the future that are collectively pushing us towards a uh, future where we are going to see more smart cities uh, that come into play, uh, driverless, connected cars, et cetera. 
That's great. Now I want to unpack that a little bit more because we are here at AWS reInvent and I, I was just looking up, we had Glenn Goron 2015 introducing AWS's IoT Cloud. And it was a funny little demo. They had a little greenhouse and you could turn on the water and open up the windows. But it's, but it's a huge suite of, of services that you guys have at your disposal leveraging AWS. So I wonder, uh, I guess Andrew, if you could speak a little bit more to the suite of tools that you can now bring to bear when you're helping your customers go through this zero trust uh, journey. Yeah, sure thing. So um, obviously there's a significant partnership in place and uh, we work together uh, pretty tremendously in the market. One of the service, are, one of the solution offerings that we've built out, which we dub uh, Deloitte Fortress, um, is, a, is a concept that plays very nicely into our zero trust framework, uh, more along the kind of horizontal components of our framework, which is really the fabric that ties it all together. Um, so the two horizontals in our framework are around tel telemetry and analytics, uh, as well as automation orchestration. And if I peel back the automation orchestration capability just a little bit, um, we, we built this Deloitte Fortress capability uh, in order for organizations to kind of streamline um, some of the um, vulnerability management aspects of the enterprise. And so we are able through integration through AWS Lambda and other functions, um, quickly identify uh, cloud configuration issues and drift uh, so that um, organizations can not only uh, quickly identify some of those issues that open up risk to the enterprise, but also in real time, um, take some action to close down those vulnerabilities and ultimately remediate them, right? So it's a way for um, to have a more kind of proactive approach to security rather than a reactive approach. Uh, everyone knows that cloud configuration issues are likely the number one kind of threat vector for attackers. And so we're able to not only help organizations identify those, but then close them down in real time. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because we hear that all the time when if there's a breach and if, if AWS is involved often, it's a, it's a configuration. You know, somebody right. left the door open basically. And it, and it really drives something you were talking about, Ravi, is the increasing importance of automation um, and, and using big data. And you talked about these kind of horizontal uh, telemetrics and analytics uh, because without automation, these systems are just getting too big and, and crazy for people to, uh, to manage by themselves. But more importantly, it's kind of a signal to noise issue when you just have so much traffic, right? You really need help surfacing that signal, as you said, so that you're proactively going after the things that matter and not being just drowned in the things that, uh, that don't matter. Ravi, you're shaking your head up and down. I think uh, you probably agree with this point. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Jeff, I and definitely agree with you and what you're saying. Uh, it, truly automation is a way of dealing with problems at scale. Uh, when, when you have hundreds of accounts and that spans across you know, multiple cloud service providers, it truly becomes a challenge to establish a particular security baseline and continue to adhere to it. And you want to have some automation capabilities in place to be able to react you know, and respond to it in real time versus it goes down to a ticketing system and, and some person is having to do you know, some triaging and then somebody else is bringing in a uh, you know, solution that they implement and eventually by the time your systems could be compromised. So uh, a good way of doing this and is leveraging automation and orchestration. It's just a capability that enhances your operational efficiency uh, by streamlining some of the manual and repetitive tasks. Um, there's numerous examples of uh, what automation and orchestration could do, but from a security context, some of the key examples are um, automated security operations, automated uh, identity provisioning, automated incident response, et cetera. Uh, one particular use case that Deloitte identified and, and built a solution around is the identification and also the automated remediation of cloud security misconfiguration. This is a common um, occurrence and use case we see across all our customers. So the way, uh, in, in the context of AWS, the way we did this is uh, we built a um, event-driven architecture that's leveraging AWS config, uh, config service that, that monitors the baselines of these different services. Uh, as and when it detects a drift from the baseline, it fires off an alert that's picked up by the CloudWatch event service that's ultimately feeding it upstream into our workflow. Uh, that leverages uh, event bridge service. From there, uh, the workflow goes into our policy engine, which is a database that has a collection of hundreds of rules that we uh, put together, uh, compliance activities. Uh, it also maps, maps back to a large set of controls frameworks so that it, this is applicable to any industry, any customer. And then based on the 
uh, violation that has occurred or based on the misconfiguration and the service, the appropriate Lambda function is, is, is deployed. And that Lambda is actually uh, performing the uh, corrective actions or the remediation actions. Uh, while, uh, you know, it might seem like a lot, but all of this is happening in near, near real time because it's leveraging uh, native services. And um, some of the key benefits that our customers see is uh, truly the ease of implementation because it's all native services on AWS. And then it, it can scale and uh, uh, cover any additional AWS accounts as, as the organization continues to scale. Uh, and one key benefit is uh, we also provide a dashboard that provides visibility into what are the top violations that are occurring in your ecosystem? How many times a particular Lambda function was uh, set off to go correct that situation? And ultimately that, that kind of view is informing uh, the upfront processes of developing secure infrastructure as code. And then also, uh, you know, correcting the security guardrails that, that might have drifted over time. Um, so that's how we've been helping our, uh, you know, customers and this, particular solution that we developed, it's called uh, Deloitte Fortress and it provides coverage across all the major cloud service providers. Yeah, that's a great summary and I'm sure you have huge demand for that because these misconfiguration things, we hear about them all the time. Uh, Andrew, I want to give you the last word before we sign off. You know, it's easy to sit on the side of the desk and say, yeah, we got a big security into everything and you got to be thinking about security from, from the time you're in, in uh, development all the way through obviously deployment and production and, and ongoing maintenance. I wonder if you could share, you know, you're on that side of the, of the glass and you're out there doing this every day. Just a couple, you know, kind of high level thoughts about how people need to make sure they're thinking about security, not only in 2020, but, but really looking down, the, uh, looking down the road. Yeah, yeah, sure thing. So, you know, first and foremost, it's important to align uh, any transformation initiative, including zero trust to business objectives, right? Don't, don't let this come off as another IT security project, right? Make sure that um, you're aligning to business priorities, whether it be, you know, pushing to the cloud uh, for scalability and efficiency, whether it be a digital transformation initiative, whether it be a new consumer identity uh, and, uh, and authorization um, capability you're trying to build. Make sure that you're aligning to those business objectives and baking in and aligning to those guiding principles of zero trust from the start, right? Because that'll ultimately help drive consensus across the various stakeholder groups within the organization uh, and build trust, if you will, in the zero trust journey. Um, one other thing I would say is focus on the fundamentals. Very often organizations struggle with some, you know, what we call general cyber hygiene capabilities, that being, you know, IT asset management and, and data classification, data governance. Um, to really fully appreciate the benefits of zero trust, it's important to kind of get some of those table stakes right, right? So you have to understand, you know, what assets you have, what the criticality of those assets are, what business processes are driven by those assets, um, what your data criticality is, how it should be classified and tagged throughout the ecosystem so that you can really enforce, you know, tag-based policy uh, decisions within, within the, the control stack, right? And then finally, in order to really um, push the needle on automation orchestration, make sure that you're using technologies that integrate with each other, right? So take an API driven approach so that you have the ability to integrate some of these heterogeneous um, security controls and drive some level of automation and, uh, and orchestration in order to enhance your, your efficiency along the journey, right? So those are just some kind of lessons learned about some of the uh, things that we would, uh, you know, tell our clients to keep in mind as they go down the adoption journey. That's a great, that's a great summary. Uh, and so we're going to have to leave it there. But uh, Andrew Ravi, thank you very much for for sharing your insight and and again, you know, supporting this this move to zero trust because that's really the way it's got to be uh, as we continue to go forward. So thanks again and uh, enjoy the rest of your uh, reinvent. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for your time. All righty, he's thanks Andrew. He's Ravi. I'm Jeff. You're watching the Cube from AWS reinvent 2020. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Thank you.